Good morning, everyone. It's another beautiful day here in Hiroshima on the second day of WCCE. How is uh, yesterday? It's very fine. That's good, very good. Yes, yeah, so, uh, we have the about the 150 or 60 attendants for on here this large rooms and uh, and uh, another 150 or the more a participant in the another room and also that we have more than 50 participant is online uh, thank you for the attend your attendance today's keynote speaker is one you you've already been waiting for Audrey Tan san yes and then um, this session chair by don't pass it i think this is rich chairs so the good morning Don san and the other sam good morning Hello. good morning yes so the i i moved to the my profile to the don san please thank you and um good morning everyone um, as the chair of IFIP TC3 and on behalf of the WCCE 2022 conference, I have enormous pleasure in welcoming you, Audrey, Audrey Tang, to speak to us all this morning. Uh, if I may say um, a few words uh, of introduction and background. Um, um, Audrey Tang is a Taiwanese free software programmer and digital minister of Taiwan. She is recognized as one of the world's most successful open source software developers. And she started her own IT company at the age of 19. In 2014, she became a digital advisor to Apple, where she was involved in artificial intelligence projects, such as the development of Apple's virtual personal assistant Siri. Following the Sunflower Student Movement demonstrations, the Prime Minister of Taiwan invited Audrey Tang to create media literacy curricula for Taiwan schools. Following this work in August 2016, she was invited to join Taiwan's executive Huan as a minister without portfolio, helping government agencies to communicate policy goals and managing information published by government through digital means. She became Taiwan's youngest ever government minister. In 2019, she made the list of the top 100 global thinkers published by Foreign Policy magazine. With too many exceptional projects for me to mention during this brief introduction, and without wishing to keep you from Audrey Tang's discussion of the questions raised in advance, I will now ask Minister Tang to address this conference. Thank you and welcome. Hello, uh, good local time, everyone. I'm really honored uh, to be here. Um, as you can see, uh, there's already a lot of questions that was raised beforehand, and I thank you for voting on it, because uh, in a duration of one hour, it is not possible for me to give detailed answer to all your questions. Indeed, that's uh, 31 questions, so less than two minutes each. Uh, so uh, it's very important that you let me know. For example, the top ones are already over 20 votes, meaning that at least 20 people would like to hear my answer to it. Uh, and there's this QR code, uh, feel free to scan. Uh, it's the same link as you have received and continue uh, voting on it. It's continuous uh, democracy. Uh, indeed, that's my job uh, in Taiwan. It is to make democracy uh, higher bandwidth, lower latency, and wider connectivity. That is to say, instead of waiting for four years, uh, uploading just a few bits uh, in a paper vote, which is still very important, of course, uh, we need to include the very young uh, people younger than 18 who do not have yet the voting uh, rights. Uh, or people overseas who cannot travel uh, to vote uh, into this kind of online voting so that we know exactly what is at focus for them and uh, we can answer accordingly. So without further ado, uh, I'll be very democratic uh, and start answering the top voted questions from this point onward. So the top question at the moment, 
in elementary, junior high, and high schools in Japan, where teachers are too busy to respond to new educational needs, including IT, information technology education. Any suggestions? Well, it's not necessarily um, to spend your time on IT. Actually, the time spent could be negative. That is to say, IT can save your time when you introduce that to your education. Consider if we do not use Slido, if we use built-in Zoom Q&A, if we uh, make everyone type their questions and then a moderator will have to read through all the questions and there's no way for the crowd to moderate. Well, that will be, of course, wasting time. But with the pro-social social media, that is Slido, uh, people continue to raise questions. Yet, during my talk, I can see at any given time what are the trending topics that people would like me to address. So in that sense, everybody saves time, and especially the lecturers save time, because we know what topics to focus on the most. And even if you're not among the 22 who voted for this question, it's like the game Tetris. You can see the uh, next two blocks, uh, and maybe those are the questions that you have in mind and are waiting to be answered. So it focuses everyone's attention on this shared social object that is this discussion. Again, this is uh, in very strong contrast to the distractions uh, that the tablets and the screens uh, that many teachers feel that if they're in the uh, students' hands, uh, they will distract people from attending to the lecture. So it all depends on how you configure the space. If the space is configured to be pro-social so that people uh, develop bonds through the use of the same um, technologies uh, or different technologies toward the same values, same goals, um, then the IT in education become a time saver. Uh, but to accomplish that, it does require um, competent planning but again, I think many of your students are digital natives. They already know many platforms beyond the Slido uh, that they feel comfortable collaborating in. Uh, maybe it's Scratch, maybe it's online spreadsheets and documents, maybe it's Minecraft. Uh, so I think it makes sense to join, to meet your students where they are and convince them that you are part of the world of co-creation. And so uh, with that, they can take care of a lot of mundane chores. Moderation, indeed, uh, code can take care of that. Uh, and then that leaves you with more time uh, to actually address the questions uh, and do your lecture and so on. You will know that uh, we did an asynchronous arrangement where the questions are collected beforehand in an online form and then put to vote a day before. Uh, and all that through this asynchronous communication save everybody time and energy. So I hope that addressed part of the question. Uh, if you feel that your question has uh, been abridged uh, or if you need to uh, ask new questions, please just post them on Slido. Uh, I will uh, look at it and surface it uh, as necessary. So um, 24 people would like to know, is it possible to measure creativity? Educators need tools to observe uh, with the learners the progress in obtaining creativity skills. This is an excellent question. Um, to me, creativity is best measured in communities. If there is a community that is creative in their endeavor, you can look at the signals, like how much this question inspire other people. 24 people gets inspired by this question. So this question may, may be more creative than other um, questions. But in isolation, in one-to-one -one setting, indeed, it's more difficult to judge creativity because it may take a lot of different modalities and the teacher may or may not be an expert in all these uh, when measuring those creative modalities. So my uh, suggestion is that uh, instead of PBL as problem-based learning, we need to imagine PBL as purpose-based learning. For example, we're here to gather, um, to share knowledge. That's our purpose. But in some of your classes, maybe the purpose is to revitalize your nearby communities 
in Taiwan, we call it regional revitalization, the same uh, in Japan. Or in some classes, the purpose may be figuring out a way to communicate about the climate urgency. Again, that is a clear purpose. With this clear purpose, well, there's more than one way to do it. People in many different modalities can work not in an individual to individual competition basis, uh, but on a uh, co-creation basis. And it's very easy then to see which ones are most creative for they may or may not be original, but they build upon this shared purpose to lay out common projects and then of course uh, face common problems. But if you start with small problems and exercises, it's harder to measure creativity. But with a larger question, like how do we develop ways to uh, build trust online? That's a very, uh, very hard and very open question. Then it becomes easy in a community to see which uh, proposals, which activities are the most creative. So a clear shared sense of purpose and a community connected to that purpose, uh, to me, is the background to measure creativity. Hope that answered the question. So um, shall I just, just go on? OK. <laughs> okay. Um, 24 people would like to know, in your opinion, which country will grow dramatically in the near future? For example, 10 years. Well, of course, it's the internet. The internet uh, with the low Earth satellites and many new technologies, so-called 6G technologies in the future, uh, will connect people in a way that feels like uh, our neighbors. At this moment, I'm just this two-dimensional image uh, with, um, of course, hand gestures, I hope uh, translated uh, properly, uh, but you do not feel uh, that we're in the same room. There's no co-presence, right? So um, I can share uh, my feelings, but uh, not my surroundings, not my ambience. Uh, but with uh, 6G uh, technologies in 10 years, we will be able to communicate not just uh, ourselves in a camera, uh, but uh, how we feel in the surroundings, the ambience. So for people in different places, they will be able to connect in such a way that it feels like co-presence. That if I look to the left, to the right, I actually see you um, nodding. Uh, or uh, if I uh, have something to show, to demonstrate, um, everyone can get a copy uh, and inspect uh, by themselves. I can transfer uh, the objects to you and so on. Um, so it will change the idea of neighborhood. Previously, the neighborhoods are the people who physically are close to you. But in 10 years, the neighborhoods will become people who identify with the same values as you, people who share the same sense of purpose as you, because the surroundings become transportable, uh, shareable over the internet. So um, there will be a lot of uh, fractal-like, snowflake-like, small so-called countries, uh, jurisdictions, where people would prefer to spend more time with and our idea of a overlapping citizenhood uh, will change. The idea of uh, citizenhood previously is limited by the Westphalian idea of the territory bounds uh, where you are and your territory determine your jurisdiction and your country and so on. But when people can join the neighborhoods that share the same sense of purpose and culture, well, it becomes possible for me to be a time zone traveler, uh, like I already am. I wake up uh, in North and South America and travel to Indo-Pacific during the day uh, and the evening. I'm in Africa and Europe. Uh, I'm already like that, but currently uh, in two dimensions. Uh, but it will become possible uh, then to feel like I'm physically among my compatriots uh, of similar values and cultures, despite that we're in very different time zones. So uh, I think the idea of a network uh, state and overlapping pluralities of network countries, that will be a reality in 10 years time. Hope that answered the question. Yes. Um, so 18 people would like to know, what is special in Taiwan's digital development? Do you think Taiwan's policy can work in other countries? For example, if you lead Japan's digital development, what you do and what, what is the difficulties? 
Um, you're already having a digital minister, uh, and we appeared in uh, panels together, uh, both the current one, and uh, uh, we, we maintain very good connections. So I, I don't uh, think that Taiwan is so special in having a digital minister. Indeed, you have a digital agency before we do. Uh, next week, we will have a Ministry of Digital Affairs for real, and I'll be the Minister uh, for Digital Affairs. Prior to that, I'm a minister at large that connects different ministries together. And we finally decided to bring in the communications, the cybersecurity, the platform economy, the e-government into a new ministry inspired by the Japanese action of the digital agency. So in that sense, Japan is in the future, or literally one hour in the future, slightly in the future. Um, now, um, I, I want to, however, share that uh, we have, because we joined later in forming a uh, Ministry of Digital Affairs, uh, we have a uh, saying that broadband is a human right. I think this is now shared uh, by the Japan uh, government uh, with the idea of no, no one left behind. Uh, but we also have another idea of we do not teach digital literacy, we teach digital competence. Indeed, competence can only be learned together. It cannot be taught because competence is when you're creative. Literacy is when you're a consumer. Competence is when you're a producer. So by making sure that people, even in the elementary school, co-create the worlds in which they learn, this changes the motivation of the student from external which is validation on examinations and so on, to internal, meaning that they want to create a world and share it with the class, with the entire country, with the international community, uh, and they can create the materials that the people after them uh, have um, access to. So I think this is uh, quite different uh, in elementary school. We stress that, uh, for example, the air qualities are measured uh, by the air box, like a Raspberry Pi or Arduino uh, chip, uh, but that is collective maintained by the students. Not only they can inform their parents whether they uh, walk to work uh, or have to take a, some transportation because of PM 2.5, uh, they learn about data stewardship, about data bias, about distributed ledgers in a way that cannot be taught and can only be learned if you co-create the material that other people rely on. So this is data democracy uh, and digital competence. I think this is a very important idea in education. And uh, I think we stand ready uh, to share with all the jurisdictions that want to join us uh, in learning from the primary schoolers, not just teaching the primary schoolers. Hope that answer your question. So 15 people would like to know, there are problems such as the difficulties of coordination between education in elementary and junior high schools and university education, like there's a gap uh, and a mismatch between education up to the undergrad level uh, university and after the graduation, the education required in the industry. So any ideas for how to facilitate the mutual cooperation? Excellent question. Now in Taiwan, um, we have um, up to 10% of students not connected um, directly to the curriculum, but they enjoy the same rights and privileges as students of their age. We call them experimental education uh, students. In experimental education, which may be homeschooled, group schooled, institution schooled, they explore ways how to solve this mismatch. For example, um, there's a middle, uh, I think senior high, uh, there's a senior high in the Taipei city uh, that is completely digital. It doesn't even have a campus, but a campus is distributed among the different places of learning, but they coordinate like the Minerva school. They coordinate both face-to-face -face on, on, and online, but there's no fixed site, no fixed seat for each student. And with this arrangement, it's become very easy then to bring into the university, even though they're just senior high, uh, to attend the university classes, to share in the university resources, because they are no longer bound by the space. The same uh, for the education required in the industry, they can connect to the institutions very easily and very quickly. So this reminds me uh, when I was 14, 
I told the head of my middle high, um, you know, um, I can spend eight hours a day after school uh, to do research, or I can spend 16 hours a day to do research. Uh, and um, the only thing that prevents me of doing research is not the access to professors and so on, because they're all available online. <laughs> it is just this law that says uh, my parents will be fined. Uh, there will be a monetary penalty uh, if I stop showing to school uh, in the middle school. It's compulsory education. Um, after I explained this, the head of my school said, well, your email printouts and all this uh, validates your claim. Um, from tomorrow on, you don't have to attend my school anymore. I'm like, what about the auditing? What about the reports and so on? And she said, well, I'll handle them for you. So, well, it was before experimental education, but already uh, people in the positions of power uh, instill in me that I still believe to this day that the career public servants are the most innovative people. Uh, they can figure out ways, even before you have a experimental education law uh, to connect you to the communities of practice. So as I understand, many teachers uh, are here uh, attending this conversation. So I would encourage you to think of ways that even within the confines of the, your current um, classes and curriculum and so on, maybe there are ways to co-create the learning environment so that the students who feel a need to connect to the academia or to the industry can begin doing so with the full blessing of you and the head of their schools. Uh, for me, it's life changing. Uh, and that led directly to the experimental education movement in Taiwan. And then now our basic education uh, full of ideas like autonomy, data competence, and so on, that was directly lifted from the research, the labs of experimental education. We take the parts that worked and then put it into our basic education reform. Uh, so this is like like a relationship between research and development. Again, this is also mutual cooperation. Um, someone uh, asks, um, I'm 16, a high school student. Uh, what were you doing and interested in and when you're 16? Um, this is a nice segue from the previous question because I dropped out when I was 14. Uh, and then uh, the research topic that I chose at the time is called swift trust, meaning um, how come that people trust random strangers online so easily, but in some antisocial spaces, why some even very good friends when they interact in some uh, specific way online, it's very easy to lose trust and even block and unfriend each other. Why do online modalities lead to quick trust and quick distrust? That was the research question uh, I was very interested in. However, it's impossible to study this question without actually constructing various different spaces and interacting with people online. So that led me to my uh, startup that I co-founded uh, with a couple other people when I was 15 years old. Uh, we collectively built uh, the first uh, customer to customer auction site uh, in Taiwan the cool bid. Uh, we built a search engine to get, uh, we built many uh, interactions online. So that led me um, to today, where I'm still studying uh, the same topic. Of course, I've shared some of my learnings, uh, like if you're fast, fair, and fun, it's easy to build trust. But if you're not fast, fair, and fun, it's easy to uh, lose trust. But it's not uh, a fixed theory. The theory changes. Whenever there's 6G, there's shared reality, there's co-presence, the theory must catch up with the modalities uh, that we're interacting with. So um, the point I'm making is that if the purpose, if the open research problem is uh, interesting enough, then it's not just me. It's people all over the world figuring out. At first is decentralization in the world web. Now, now it's centralization in web 2.0. Now we're looking at re-decentralization in web 3 and so on. And all this lead to different theories of swift trust and distrust. So I'm still uh, in the trenches, so to speak. Uh, I still publish uh, to the social archive, uh, the open access papers uh, and so on. Uh, so uh, it's important to choose a topic that is open, that is wide, that is fast and fair and fun. Uh, 
Hope that answers your question. So 17 people would like to know. Some elementary school teachers believe it is better for the development of children uh, when they write and create products in a tangible way with their own hands. It cannot be the same if it is done on the screen or virtually. So how would you address them and how to appropriate initiate them to computers in the class? I firmly believe that technology should adapt to serve the humanity. It's not that the society to change, to adapt to the technologists. This is the most important thing. Uh, it's variously called as appropriate technology or inclusive technology and so on. So in this particular case, we need to look at technologies that uh, caters to the people who learn with a modality of interaction. And only then can they be part of the class. So uh, which is why, for example, I always interact with a screen with a stylus. Uh, this is my phone and I always interact with a stylus. Uh, lest that you think uh, it's about Android, it's Apple too. I also have a uh, Apple Pencil. Uh, so um, in, in this sense, um, because I think in a canvas and I find that only with a stylus or a pencil can I think in a way that is intentional. If it is a touch screen, it becomes not me swiping the screen. Very quickly, it becomes the screen swiping me. Uh, and so I lose my autonomy. I don't have creativity anymore. Uh, I become conditioned uh, by the touch screen. Um, I become very easily addicted. Maybe it's just me, but I have a inkling that it's not just me. So uh, I have this discipline that I always interact with the screen um, on the pencil or mouse or keyboard or touchpad, anything but a touch screen. Uh, and I think this is a um, sign that I'm asking the technology to adapt to my particular psychological needs, not changing my psychology into that of a addicted fear of missing out uh, space just because the touch screen uh, application developers want it that way. Um, and so uh, to take full control of how the technology is deployed, this is the most important thing. Just like a stylus can be used as a way to draw things, we too should cultivate the kind of interactions on the classes that caters to the people who prefer more to that of a tangible. So maybe you fold uh, like origami and things like that, uh, but um, you put it in a overhead uh, camera so that the camera can during your folding uh, figure out what you're folding and share it so that you can 3D print um, your folding uh, materials, uh, the products, and so on. Uh, so the people feel that, oh, when you're interacting with the idea, the computer is here to help you to disseminate the idea, to share the idea, to find a community. But the computer is not here to automate you, uh, to take your hands away uh, from the act of creation. Um, and I think the way that teachers interact with such technologies will have a defining influence on the students. If the teachers is very afraid of technology, uh, distance themselves with technology, then it's far more likely that a student will one day out of rebellion or individuation or whatever, uh, just uh, embrace technology with all its downsides. This is very much like uh, banning uh, the certain discussions or banning manga or banning anime uh, and, and so on uh, in my childhood, right? So if the teachers take a uh, distancing behavior, then it doesn't work. Uh, but during my childhood, um, for, for a while, my dad uh, tried to ask me to not play video games because he feels that video games are too addictive. Uh, and then I asked him to sit down and play the video game I'm playing uh, with me. Um, it happens to be Sid Meier's civilization. Uh, and I explained to him that I wasn't able to read the history books because I don't know uh, what a, uh, a boat looked like uh, that uh, was before the steam engine and after the steam engine and so on. Uh, I don't have this first-hand knowledge of how it feels like to live uh, so, so far away back. But with the game, uh, it becomes easier for me to imagine 
the kind of conflicts, the kind of philosophies, the kind of technological responses uh, to the various historical moments. And then it becomes easy for me to read uh, Will Durant's uh, History of the World uh, that he bought, uh, which is a lot of paper uh, tomes. Uh, and without the, the civilization game as kind of introduction course, uh, it's impossible for me to engage uh, with the history books. Uh, and just like the head of my school, uh, my dad is a very reasonable person, uh, and he became convinced. Uh, and then we play some video games together. So I think um, it's important for the teachers uh, to listen to the students, but also to uh, make your own uh, intention um, designs so that uh, it's the video game, of course, but choose the kind of video game that resonates well with the history class, with whatever class you're teaching, and then you will be able to build rapport, to build mutual support uh, with your students. And then the student will learn competence is only when you can design your own interactions with computers and with screens. Hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, 18 people would like to know, um, I'm the Clark Memorial International High School student. Is there anything we should do uh, while we are students? What current technology is the most important to master? That's actually two questions. The first question, um, I always stress, uh, you need to sleep well and sleep plenty. Um, I don't function well without eight hours of sleep, but you're a high school student, maybe you need nine hours of sleep, it's up to you. Uh, and if I don't sleep enough, like if I sleep only for six hours, I always make sure to take a nap as soon as possible to make up uh, for the eight hours that I need. Because the debt uh, by sleep de deprivation cannot be repaid in the weekends. Uh, it hurts the, the brain. The short-term memory does not write completely to long-term memory if you are in a state of sleep deprivation for as uh, few as just three days. So um, if you study uh, way late, but you have to wake up early in the morning, chances are that uh, the fragmented knowledge you write into your long-term memory uh, may be clouded in a way that does not uh, create a canvas for creative thinking. Uh, and that has this long-term effect. And I understand Japan, just like Taiwan, is a society that prides hard work. Uh, and so sleep deprivation uh, may be uh, a problem in, in your jurisdiction, just like in ours. Uh, so whenever I give a uh, talk to a high school students, I always stress that sleep sufficiently. That's a precondition of you actually learning anything. Now, some high school students, uh, after attending uh, one of my lectures, eventually started a petition on uh, our e-petition platform, join platform, that says um, the schools doesn't open the first class uh, until I think it was nine or something. Uh, but many schools that they uh, were hailing from required that they are at school uh, already at uh, 10 past eight or something. Uh, and they think this is unnecessary because they were not doing anything anyway. Uh, so uh, it's just for the convenience or whatever. Uh, so they asked the Ministry of Education to change the rules so that they can attend the class only uh, when the first class begins. Uh, so that they can get sufficient amount of sleep, quoting me. <clears throat> and interestingly, um, more than 5,000 uh, students sign on this petition very quickly. Uh, and even that was during COVID, we held this online discussions where many high school students make very recent arguments, citing the latest on the sleep research, saying that the teacher's uh, job will be reduced, uh, decimated, uh, if uh, they do not sleep well or the students do not sleep well. And finally, the schools said that they require still one day a week for the announcements or the deliberations about the school's uh, internal proceedings or whatever. So one day a week, you will still have to attend the school uh, on 8 a.m. or something. Uh, but for the rest of the week, um, yeah, everybody can sleep uh, until the first class. So it was successful social movement. Um, so uh, to answer the second half of the question, I think the most important technology is thinking about democracy as a kind of social technology, to think about ways to do governance that let people share their powers in a way that feels safe to them. The join platform 
combines a lot of cutting edge research. For example, just like Slido, you can post your ideas and the counter uh, points, but there's no way to reply to each other. So there's no room for personal attack, but there is very easy for us to surface the most uh, cogent points on the pro and the con so that we can focus our conversation very easily by the upvotes and so on. So um, by taking into the social interaction design, we create a safe space for a democracy that makes safe power sharing easier for the principals and the Ministry of Education. And this is, uh, of course, I'm biased because this is my line of research, but I really think that democracy as a social technology is the most important to master because it allows you as a high school student, just like in Taiwan, to um, take control of your fate even before you turn 18. Uh, and if you become an active citizen, engage in this way, chances are you will also inspire other people. Uh, mo most of the most important uh, e-petitions, most significant e-petitions online here in Taiwan were created by people around 17 year old and 70 year old working together because they both have more time on their hands, I guess, uh, and also care more about the future sustainability instead of just the next quarter's profit and losses. So long-term thinking through democracy as a social technology, I think this is very important to master together. 18 people would like to know, what is the major goals of life in your current point of view? Um, to me, the point of life is to leave the world a better place when I log out compared when I log in. That is to say, be a good enough ancestor. Now, the idea of good ancestor is not new. I certainly didn't create this. Uh, many uh, indigenous people uh, in Canada, among other places, uh, have this idea of seven generations. That is to say, when we plan for profit and losses, we need to think about people seven generations down the line to be a good ancestor, not just uh, be a good person to your current citizens. Because in a democracy, it's easy to forget about future people because by definition, they don't have a vote. Uh, but if we only optimize uh, for the people 18 years or older in the society, then the people who don't have a vote are at a disadvantage. It becomes easier then in the name of liberalism or market capitalism and so on to make decisions that make the current generation prosper at the expense of future generations. This is an inherent issue in representative democracy. So uh, studying ways to live a life of good enough ancestor is to give the future generations a vote, metaphorically speaking. In New Zealand, for example, the Maori people, the indigenous people, have this idea that the Wananui River, um, among others, uh, have spirit. And this spirit, constitutionally speaking for them, including the right to health, the right to sustain, and so on. So just like a person, uh, this natural personhood idea takes the idea of this sanctity of health and life and so on, I guess it's a river, so the right to move, I guess, uh, into account. Uh, and they appoint uh, the um, stewards. Uh, it's just like uh, if you're someone uh, who are represented by your lawyer and so on, uh, because you're too young or because if you, you don't know how the law works and so on. So there are people who are speakers from the indigenous and from the um, government communities uh, to uh, take the representativeness of the river, taking care of its future, sitting on the board of companies, uh, voting uh, on the decisions, suing for damage, uh, and so on. So representing this person, uh, this river as a person, is one of the ways to invent in the democracies the interest of people seven generations down the line. Now, good enough ancestor means we are not trying to be a perfect ancestor. Because again, when we're creating solutions, if we take away possibilities, if we over concentrate power so that people younger than us do not have a way to change our solutions, then maybe our solution seems perfect for our generation. But what we're actually doing is taking liberty away 
from future generations. But it's very uh, easy to fall into the trap uh, if you take an optimizing mindset, like collect enough data, like an AI calculates the most optimal utility function. Uh, but most of the um, future generations need cannot be anticipated by the data of the past and the present. So be good enough is also to ask ourselves in doing our design, are we over optimizing for the present? Do people one generation, two generation down the line have the means to just redesign completely if they face a very different threat, a very different challenge like the COVID, nobody designed for it, but there was sufficient flexibility and agility in the design of our public health system so we can respond in time. So again, being open, not foreclosing the future, free the future, this is also very important and a major goal of life to me. Seventeen people would like to know, what industry do you think will grow in the future, about 10 years, which is still underrated now? This is an excellent question. I think, as I mentioned, the industry or well, the business of making communities that people feel that they're also a citizen in. Um, you can call it world building, I guess, uh, community building, uh, of course, it's just like traditional community building, but in a way that transcends time zones. Um, this is a future. I, I won't say it's underrated because you hear all this uh, calls to metaverses or things like that. So it's not underrated. But I do think that a lot of our conversations around metaverses was not around community building at this moment. Uh, it was more about um, advertisement, selling merchandise, uh, making sure that people um, have the coolest avatar and things like that. Of course, that may be interesting uh, from a design point of view, um, but if people do not have the most uh, basic right of determining what kind of community they want, if they need to go through an intermediary, a gatekeeper, uh, that takes, I don't know, 25% or 52% cut of all transactions uh, and so on, then it becomes harder to imagine community building. It would be essentially the landlord uh, setting uh, all the rules about governance uh, and the people who rent the room, uh, well, they can be escorted out by private bouncers anytime, right? So if you focus on community building, then the idea of metaverse must give way to the idea of a, a plurality, so not a singularity where everybody meets on this flat metaverse, but rather everyone has the ability to form new personal connections uh, like email, like podcast. Um, there are decentralized technologies that freeze the future instead of constrains the future into a few bottlenecks or choke points. So this idea of re-decentralization, I think that's underrated the idea of connecting to the social sector to the co-ops to the social entrepreneurs to community building and not captured by this um choke point capitalism that's a thing you can look it up uh, not captured by choke point capitalism i think this is underrated now but that is the direction we need to go if we are going to grow a future where there are many different universes where we can uh, freely associate among ourselves again retaining the freedom to associate to free speech and also to the press to set the ways um, that freeze our imaginations not in a particular way of formatting our expressions but rather to express the way we want to interact itself as a way to uh, express the possibilities that imagine new ways of social organizations and so on. That is very underrated at the moment. So 14 people would like to know, in Japan, communication on social media and the internet causes trouble. So here's the question. Is this problem also happening in Taiwan? Also, are there any special communication issues related to the internet and SNS in Taiwan? Um, according to the uh, VDEM project, uh, for many years running now, Taiwan is identified by experts as the place uh, with the highest amount of information manipulation attacks 
from outside of our jurisdiction. That is to say, uh, we're subject to the most relentless assault of information manipulation. This is quite unique uh, in Taiwan. Um, on the other hand, this uh, raised the, the antibody the um, immunity, the inoculation level of everyone in Taiwan. Just like if you get repeated exposed uh, to various different uh, coronavirus variants, at some point you would develop a, a very strong antibody that keeps you healthy uh, against new Greek alphabets, new variants. Um, the same in Taiwan. So in 2018, for example, we have a very special issue uh, leading to the mayoral and uh, referendum election that year, we saw a lot of um, external advertisements on Facebook and other social media that precision targets particular part of our voters. And interestingly, it's not on political issues, it's on social issues. Uh, there was a trending rumor that said, for example, the people in Hong Kong, they're not protesters. They're young people being paid $200,000 to murder police, to cause riot, and so on, with a very scary looking photo that was taken by Reuters. So the photo is real, but the Reuters report originally only said that there are young protesters in Hong Kong. That, that's it. Uh, but this alternate caption, uh, it's something new, it's manufactured, uh, and, and precision advertisements were used to change people's uh, feelings around Hong Kong. Now, this creates a particular challenge, because we must not take it down. If we take it down, it actually feel conspiracy theories, like this must be something right, otherwise the state would not uh, be taking it down. So trying to take down or in like a uh, coronavirus lockdown uh, or any top down um, takedown uh, measures, that will actually feel uh, a fatigue. Uh, if you're in lockdown for too long, uh, you, you don't trust the government anymore because uh, there's uh, this lack of coordination among the community that was inhibited by the lockdown. So in 2018, instead, uh, we chose a way called notice and public notice. We notice this, but the state does not do fact checking. Instead, we encourage independent journalists with contributions uh, by, for example, the COFAX project of the G0V community, COFAX. They work with the international fact checking network like Taiwan Fact Check Center, Michael Penn, but also our private sector, uh, Trend Micro, uh, Who's Call, that's Google Look, and so on, to collect the signals. It's like contact tracing. Uh, we can see which variants of information manipulation are having a higher basic reproduction number, a higher R number, and the ones that do not have a higher R number uh, because people voluntarily share the signals on the line platform. Uh, you can long press and say, I think this is maybe information manipulation. And we get to see which ones are trending. So the ones that are not trending, we simply ignore them because they die out very easily. Uh, but the ones that are trending, the fact checkers focus their contact tracing, their attribution uh, power to trace this alternate caption of people being paid to murder police uh, to the Zhongyang Zheng Fa Wei Chang An Jian, the Chang An Sword Weibo account uh, by the Communist uh, Political and Law Unit. So it uh, occurs uh, to everyone then that this alternate caption first appear on that Weibo account, uh, and then people start adding on it. So Facebook and many social media, they promise then to have this mandatory label, so you can still share it, but just like you can send spam, but the recipient will see this, uh, this email is labeled as spam, as a junk mail. The same for the label. The label will say, then, um, well, this about, you know, murdering police, whatever. Uh, the photo is real, but this caption is sponsored uh, by the political and law unit of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, click here to learn more. And this is an independent investigation uh, by professional journalists with the help of the citizen fact checking community. Now, if we take that down, there's no way for the middle schoolers to participate in this collaborative fact checking, only by leaving it up tolerating it a little bit, but do contact tracing and so on. Can we actually develop antibodies together? Because when people see this with this label, 
they're aware that a there's information manipulation going on and second maybe they also can participate in the fact checking community these are the democratic uh, competence digital competence that i was alluding to a few questions back so making those incoming virus um, immunize the population by the people uh, specializing in journalism, civic journalism, just like public health, uh, to take the mRNA of the incoming virus, uh, change a spike protein, uh, and so on. We can make uh, a viral vaccine uh, that shields uh, our, our mind against potential new mutations of the virus of the mind. I hope that answered this question. So um, with 10 minutes left, left uh, I must apologize because there's new questions coming up. Uh, I answer one and there's new ones coming up. <laughs> so I cannot address them all. Uh, maybe I can only address two more questions. Um, so uh, Mitsuka would like to know, in the strive of democratizing technology, how do we keep each individual, including big tech, accountable for their own actions? And how do we share access when much of the power lies within the top? This is a great question. There's a power within a network. So in a company, for example, if it's structured in a hierarchy or in a government uh, ministry, if it's structured hierarchically, indeed, the power lies in the top and they must be shared, but it's not always easy. On the other hand, there are also uh, network making power, to use the term from Manuel Castells. Network making power is like a switching power. The power is in the intersectionality of networks. So if you are the only one in your hierarchy that have a strong positive support, mutual trust with some other network where you are also not in the top, this connecting power, this switching power enables you to take account of this hierarchy with the viewpoint of that hierarchy and vice versa. And then you create this horizontal power that connects different worlds together in a way that holds them mutually accountable. So in a democratic society, the role of academia, of media in general, journalism and so on, serves as this connecting agency that makes the hierarchies that otherwise would not meet, they will then have to meet with each other because otherwise they lose legitimacy. One example about democratizing technology. In 2015, when Uber first entered Taiwan, uh, they started uh, operating legally, but in uh, just a few months, they start recruiting people without professional driver's license. And their idea, very simply put, at the time is that their code dispatch better than laws. So in the name of efficiency, people shouldn't obey the old laws, but should indeed obey the new code. Uh, and so uh, that went viral. It's a so-called sharing economy. Uh, but of course, people didn't like the idea, uh, say it's not sharing economy. They're not even carpooling. Uh, they, they are doing gig economy, extractive uh, economy or whatever. Now, if we keep on this ideological debate, we cannot solve practical problems. The only way to solve this issue is to ask everyone who are a stakeholder, who have a stake. So we send to the taxi union, to the Uber uh, drivers, Uber passenger, everyone the same link. It's like Polis, it's like Slido, but on Polis, instead of this one dimensional ranking like Slido, we have this two dimensional canvas where you can see which people feel close to you. You can see their sentiments like uh, insurance is necessary, registration is necessary and so on. And you can like or dislike, but the like or dislike simply put you in different clusters and uh, solves for the distance, not uh, to uh, shout down any person. But for the people who are on different camps, it has two effects first. You see your friends and families feeling very differently. Maybe you didn't talk about this over dinner, but it shows that it is possible then to have different ideologies while the second point, while seeing, oh, actually, 
for the majority of reflections after three weeks of voting without replying, um, people can see that everyone sees registration, insurance, and so on. These are important. They feel that search pricing is great, but undercutting meter not so great. They feel like uh, in the places where there's uh, no Uber service because they're too rural and so on, the local co-ops, temples, churches must also be authorized, not just for profit companies to run their own fleets in a sharing economy way and so on. So all these are the points, the uh, consensus, the common points hidden in plain sight. If we focus on gig economy versus sharing economy, there's no way for us to know that actually we mostly agree with most of each other on most of everything. And then we hold ourselves accountable saying, we invite Uber representative, taxi representative, and so on. And our agenda is crowdsourced. Just like I only answer to the top voted slide of question, they only answer to the top 10 sentiments widely agreed by the passengers and the drivers alike. So um, Uber then have to commit saying, okay, okay, we will not undercut existing meters. We'll make sure our driver have professional license and so on and so forth. While the taxi companies who want to serve the rural places also receive new business models. For, for the past few years now, Uber is a legal taxi company, the Q-Taxi in Taiwan, but yet in the rural areas, the co-ops, the people who uh, take care of the elderly and so on, they can also get a professional driver's license and start carpooling or driving for tourism or whatnot. Uh, so this is what I call people-public-private partnership, starting with the norm that people broadly agree on amplify that with the public sector's platforms, and then the private sector hold each other accountable, implementing the same norms. This is how we get the power that was previously concentrated at the top, nevertheless agree, because they see that their constituents, their employees, their members, they already have norms. They already agree with each other across those different hierarchies. So for them to stay relevant, they will have to share their power. So I hope that answered the question. So the final question then, um, do you think that the study of quantum physics have impact on our future? If so, how will it impact? Well, I think it will have a strong impact if only to free ourselves from the uh, computational thinking that was limited by the von Neumann model. Uh, a lot of people think about computational thinking in a way that is more about sequential, um, the factoring, refactoring of large problem to the small problems, the sequential processing, the automation and things like that, uh, which is how classical computers work. Uh, but because I study uh, functional programming, uh, that's my professional training, um, to me, uh, the world is not something that you issue command and ask the world uh, to follow your command. To me, the world uh, is um, something that you observe with a value and then uh, make sure that the world you observe um, colleagues around the kind of value that you share with other members of the world. And I think this kind of functional viewpoint, although it was not the mainstream, and now it is more mainstream in computer science, uh, it will gain new boost if people learn about qubits, about ion traps, and all sorts of different ways to build quantum computers and free our mind about what computational thinking really means. So thank you for the awesome questions. And this will be the end uh, of this lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Tang. Thank you very much for sharing your, your insights and also for your very positive way of looking forward. I think that this is uh, so important for us um, that we, we need to take on board um, a positive way in order for us to think about how to move forward, not only for ourselves, but for our futures. And uh, I, I also um, very much can associate with your thinking with regard to the um, consumer producer, uh, I would call it a dilemma that we have, and maybe how we balance that in the future. 
um, and also your 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 great concern for democratization and how we view that across our our entire population and that we we don't forget that we need to take on board our young people um, and that we, we we treat our young people with respect with regard to democratization so i thank you for your insights and your your ways of answering those questions and the attention and the detail that you've given to us thank you so much thank you thank you live long and prosper thank you Thank you so much. And uh, on behalf of the uh, participants on site, uh, again, uh, I will uh, give uh, the uh, great appreciation for, uh, to your uh, address and the insightful talk. So thank you so much. And, uh, and also the, uh, uh, the session chair, Don, uh, thank you so much for a very uh, yeah, uh, good and, uh, uh, address. And uh, so the, this uh, session is uh, uh, finished and th at this moment. So uh, thank you for, yes. And uh, so, <laughs>